So from the time they first met as delegates to the Congress of the Confederation in 1782, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison started working together to strengthen the central government of the country. Despite some agreement, disagreements, their alliance strengthened and deepened over the next several years with their contributions to the Annapolis Convention in 1786 and the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. This alliance reached its peak with their collaborative effort on the Federalist Essays and their battles to get the Constitution ratified in New York, in Virginia, and across the country in 87 and 88. So whether they were in the same city or whether they were back in their home states, they engaged in frequent communication and exchange of ideas. They even signed their letters with expressions of true friendship and affection. So their political philosophy and their support for the Constitution were so well integrated that their contemporaries and later historians argued over who wrote which Federalist essays. However, soon after Hamilton became Treasury Secretary and, Hamilton and Madison was elected to represent Virginia in Congress in 1789, their deep relationship began to unravel. So Hamilton proposed a bold series of initiatives in his major reports to Congress in 1790 and 1791, and most of these Madison vigorously opposed. As time went on, Madison became ever more vocal in his opposition not only to Hamilton, but also to President Washington, arguing that many of their actions were unconstitutional. By 1792, Hamilton was writing a letter to Edward Carrington complaining that Madison and Jefferson were the head of a faction that was decidedly hostile to him. And John Beckley, clerk of the House of Representatives, reported to Madison that Hamilton considered him, quote, a personal and political enemy. So the question must then be asked, what went wrong, what changed, and who changed that led these allies to become bitter adversaries and led to the creation of two diametrically opposed political parties, the Federalists, under Hamilton and the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson and Madison. And that's what this presentation will examine. And I'm gonna start with a brief summary of their origins and background. So um, Hamilton on the left was born on the island of Nevis in the Caribbean in approximately 1754, 1755. He also lived on St. Eustatius and St. Croix, worked at the merchant firm of Beekman and Kruger and learned about finance there uh, with hands-on experience. He immigrated to America and began uh, studying at King's College in New York, uh, today's Columbia University. Soon after that, he joined the Patriot cause and he published pamphlets uh, titled The Full Vindication of the Measures of Congress and the Farmer Refuted. After fighting broke out at Lexington and Concord in 1775, he joined a, a volunteer militia corps, then a New York artillery company. He served as an aide de camp to Washington for four years he led the assault on Redoubt 10 in Yorktown in 1781. And beyond that, uh, in spite of all his military duties, during the war he studied finance, figuring out how to revive the devastated American economy when the war was finally over. And as early as 1780, again while the war was still going on, he called for strengthening the Articles of Confederation. So now for um, Madison. So Madison was born in Virginia in 1751 and that was his permanent home for his entire lifetime, mostly at uh, Montpelier, the family's plantation house. So Virginia was his home, and as a result, he had close ties to fellow Virginians, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and James Monroe. Um, uh, Madison went to the College of New Jersey, uh, today's Princeton University, and back in Virginia, he fought hard for the free exercise of religion for all, not just religious to tolerance. During the war, he joined his father's militia company, but he didn't see any combat. But he did uh, serve on the governor's council during the war under governors Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. So now, um, um, towards the end of the war, in 1780, Madison served, uh, began serving in the Congress of the Confederation. So when he arrived in Philadelphia, he was pretty well shocked by what he saw. So there was no money in the treasury. Um, it was near impossible for the government to gain credit. It was near impossible to get the states to pay their fair share of the tax burden. And um, most importantly, perhaps, uh, there was pressure from veterans of the war who were anxious to be paid. And one thing that's interesting is Madison considered proposing the use of implied powers in the Articles of Confederation. 
So use military force, including the Navy, to blockade states, uh, prevent them from breaching trade embargoes, and coerce them into paying their uh, tax burden. And uh, keep that point in mind about implied powers, because it's going to come back later on. So in 1782, Hamilton was appointed to the Confederation Congress in November, and that's where he met Madison for the first time. And again, the backdrop is uh, the army officers were petitioning for back pay. There was an implicit threat of mutiny that later became an actual threat. Uh, Congress was unable to get revenue from the states. So uh, Hamilton, when he arrived in Philadelphia, um, he immediately got to work as per usual. So he gave a speech in Congress uh, the day after he arrived there. And he started working with Madison to try to get Rhode Island to agree to a bill on imposts or tariffs. And Hamilton, again, got to work right away. He was the author of the committee's report. And he argued that in his report, if Congress is given a task, it must have powers necessary for car carrying out that task. So again, think of the necessary and proper clause of the later Constitution. So uh, the only problem was Hamilton was maybe a little bit too enthusiastic and unwilling to compromise. So he frightened some members of Congress, and Madison blamed Hamilton for derailing the original version of his funding plan. And then Madison offered a compromise funding proposal, and it passed with a big majority, um, but Hamilton voted against it because he thought it was too weak. So that irritated Madison again. And after that, a, a new crisis arose. So on March, sorry, uh, May 26, 1783, the army was furloughed, but some Pennsylvania uh, troops uh, decided to march to Philadelphia where Congress was sitting. Hamilton uh, asked for the Pennsylvania militia to face down the troops, but the Pennsylvania Executive Council refused to allow this. The troops became more threatening, and Hamilton advised that Congress remove from Philadelphia to Princeton, and it did that. So there were consequences of all this. Um, first of all, it um, increased this debate over standing army versus state militias. Um, it, it had, there were questions about the ability of Congress to compel states to pay their tax burden. And then there's a question about where the national capital should be. So as a result of this incident, um, as you know, in the, in, uh, under the Constitution, Washington, Washington DC is not located in any state. Uh, partly in order to avoid being subservient to that state, but also to avoid the risk of not being properly defended by that state. So by October of 1783, both Hamilton and Madison had left Congress, but their political partnership had begun. But even, even from the very beginning, there were some disagreements between them. Um, so now we're going to take a look at the uh, Mount Vernon Conference. So um, after he left Congress, um, Madison worked with uh, Washington and Edmund Randolph and others to promote interstate cooperation. And that was something that was sorely lacking under the Articles of Confederation. So this was an agreement about um, the use of the Potomac River. And the conference was held at Washington's Mount Vernon in 1785. And the relative success of this conference led to a call for a conference of all the states to regulate interstate commerce. And uh, um, that was held at Annapolis in 1786. So um, at first, Madison didn't want to openly propose a general revision of the Articles of Confederation. But Hamilton and Madison both wanted to strengthen and revise the Articles. So in one way, the Annapolis Convention was a failure because only five states sent their delegates. Only three of these had a quorum allowing them to vote officially on behalf of their states. But on the other hand, in another sense, the convention was a success because discussion quickly moved from commerce to revision of the articles. Hamilton drafted a report, and that was approved after some of his fiery language was toned down. And the report called explicitly for a general convention to revise the articles to be held at Philadelphia in May of 1787. So, uh, after the, the convention was called, um, six states uh, quickly appointed delegates, but the other states decided to wait and see what Congress would say. And there was actually considerable opposition in Congress, and Madison had to use his powers of persuasion to get them to go along. And he also wrote letters to um, Jefferson and Randolph and uh, Washington setting out his plan for a constitution, 
and Madison gets credit, the main credit, for persuading uh, Washington to attend the, con uh, uh, the, the convention and to uh, preside over it. And also, uh, Madison prepared speeches pointing out uh, the weakness of government under the Articles. And then in New York State, in contrast, uh, Governor George Clinton opposed the convention, but Hamilton in the state legislature argued in favor of it. And New York agreed to send only three delegates, Hamilton and two Clinton allies, and thus Hamilton was always a minority voice in the delegation. So uh, Madison was the main author of the Virginia Plan, um, and that favored the large states. Um, Patterson represented, uh, presented the uh, New Jersey Plan, which favored small states, and then there was the Hamilton Plan, and um, this was later used against uh, Hamilton uh, to claim that he was you know, supposedly a monarchist. And in fact, um, Hamilton was presenting an extreme position as a tactical maneuver in order to make the Virginia Plan seem more moderate. And at the time, Madison apparently understood this because I don't think he was complaining about it until later. And at one point, he, he seems to have acknowledged Hamilton's actual intentions. So after this speech, um, Hamilton left the convention. He had two long absences. Um, and he wasn't there for the Connecticut Compromise that balanced the interests of the large and the small states. But he did come back in time to serve on the Committee of Style along with Madison. And although neither Hamilton nor Madison was fully satisfied with the Constitution, they both committed themselves to the battle for its ratification. And uh, after, as soon as the conference was over, Madison had to rush to Congress in New York to save the Constitution from a proposal by Richard Henry Lee of Virginia to add a Bill of Rights. And a Bill of Rights sounds like a good thing, but this uh, seemingly innocent proposal would have transformed the Constitution into an act of Congress, and that would have required unanimous approval from all 13 states, and that wasn't going to happen. So Madison helped defeat this proposal by emphasizing Article 7, and that specified that the Constitution should be ratified by state conventions, not by Congress. So next, uh, we'll take a look at the Federalist Papers. Hamilton was alarmed by attacks on the Constitution in the press, and he published on October 27, 1787, what became the first of the, federal, uh, the Federalist Essays. And he wrote an outline, and he made a really good choice uh, choosing Publius as a pseudonym, a, a Roman uh, hero and statesman, and gaining a great advantage by selecting Federalist as the name for the project and supporters of the project, uh, because uh, then the opposition was left with the term anti-federalist, which uh, sounded uh, pretty negative. So Hamilton tried to get Gouverneur Morris uh, to uh, help uh, write essays. He tried to get William Dewar, but Dewar wrote some uh, lousy essays that Hamilton rejected. Uh, John Jay wrote five essays, but he was, uh, he was uh, limited by illness and injury. And at some point in the fall of 1787, Madison joined Hamilton on the project for the Federal Essays. And it's, it's really interesting to see the depths of their collaboration. They were both in New York. Uh, Madison would uh, come over to uh, Hamilton's place. They would strategize. They would divide up the labor according to their areas of expertise. But as time went on and they became ever busier, they stopped meeting. And uh, in 1788, uh, Madison writes a letter to Jefferson, and he says, though carried in concert, the writers are not mutually answerable for all the ideas of each other, there being seldom time for even a perusal of the pieces by anyone but the writer before they were wanted at the press, and sometimes hardly by the writer himself. So it sounded like, you know, um, to me it sounds like uh, Madison was saying, if you see something in the essays that you don't like, maybe it wasn't my idea, maybe it was something that came from, from Hamilton. And then later in 1820, much later, he, he kind of refines this idea uh, and modifies it a little bit. He says, in the beginning, it was the practice of the writers, of A.H. and J.M. particularly, to communicate to each other uh, their respective papers before they were sent to the press. This was rendered so inconvenient by the shortness of the time allowed that it was dispensed with. Another reason was that it was found most agreeable to each not to give a positive sanction to all the doctrines and sentiments of the other there being a known difference in the general complexion of their political theories. So as Madison later remembers it, or 
once it remembered, you know, there already were these divisions between them. Uh, but they decided uh, not to let that get in the way of uh, carrying out the project uh, of the Federalist Essays. So um, now let's take a look at the ratifying conventions. And um, Hamilton had to write the final essays in part because Madison had to hurry back to Virginia. He needed to campaign for election to the ratifying convention there due to strong anti-federalist sentiment. But um, it's, it's kind of dramatic if you can imagine you know, the absence of uh, immediate communication like we have today. They were sending letters back and forth. They kept in close contact. Uh, they were sharing their concerns and their strategies. And they were, again, writing each other with you know, trust and, and with friendship. Um, and uh, there were different uh, tactics to try to uh, derail uh, the Constitution. So Jefferson wrote from France arguing the states that had not yet ratified, like Virginia, should withhold ratification until a Bill of Rights was adopted, and Governor Patrick Henry agreed. And George Mason, who had refused to sign the Constitution, thought it would be clever to insist on a close reading of the Constitution, and that would, you know, he could dissect it to death. But uh, this was uh, a mistake because Madison knew the Constitution inside and out, and he defended it really well. Also, the delay allowed Hamilton time to get printed copies of the Federalists to Virginia for Madison to distribute. So it, it really was beneficial for them. And Hamilton, for his part, um, if we go to New York, um, he wanted to delay a vote until either New Hampshire or Virginia had ratified, and that would put pressure on New York. And he, he, he wanted a uh, an express rider to be sent uh, to bring word if either state had ratified. And then news was received. Um, Hamilton sent the rider on to Virginia, but by that time, Virginia had already ratified, however, um, insisting on amendments. And back in New York, uh, Hamilton wrote to Madison, and he said, well, um, New York is willing to ratify, but only conditionally. So they want a Bill of Rights, and we'll ratify, we'll wait for a Bill of Rights. If we don't get it, we're going to withdraw from uh, the contract. And Madison wrote back and said, this is impossible. And not only that, but he wrote to Washington to express his frustration with Hamilton. How could Hamilton um, even consider this kind of option? But in the meantime, uh, Hamilton read Madison's letter to the convention in New York. And they, after that, after hearing from Madison, agreed to ratify unconditionally. But after that, um, Governor Clinton would write a circular letter to other governors asking for a second constitutional convention, again, for amendments. But this was something that um, Madison really was afraid of allowing to happen because it might undo the whole project. So um, Madison wrote again to express his frustration to Washington. So now let's take a look. Uh, we'll uh, move forward to the presidential election. So once the Constitution was ratified, uh, attention was turned to that election. And Madison and Hamilton were again in agreement. They thought Washington should be president, Adams should be vice president, but they also knew that there was this flaw in the Constitution and they needed to avoid the risk of a tie or the accidental election of John Adams as president. So Hamilton worked behind the scenes to convince some electors to withhold their votes just to be on the safe side. Um, so, uh, and then Adams you know, found out about it and he never forgave, uh, forgave Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton hoped that Madison would serve in the cabinet, but Madison decided instead to run for Congress. And Hamilton thought, you know, and he wrote this to Madison, at least the government would have a strong ally in Congress. Um, and Madison ran for the Senate, but Patrick Henry made sure that he was not appointed again, because uh, Henry was against the Constitution um, and was, was trying as, as hard as he can to slow things down. And next, Madison decided to run for the House. And at that point, um, uh, Patrick Henry's allies uh, gerrymandered uh, Madison's district, and they persuaded his friend James Monroe to stand against him. And in spite of um, those tricks, um, Madison uh, managed to win. And one way he managed to win was by promising to, uh, um, to argue for a Bill of Rights, something that he had previously rejected as unnecessary. So um, in the first federal Congress, Madison proposed trade duties. 
um, that favored France and punished England. So this aligned him uh, more uh, with Jefferson. And, um, but uh, Madison um, drafted Washington's first inaugural address. Washington asked both Hamilton and Madison for advice on protocol, thus showing that at this point he still trusted both men implicitly. And uh, Madison, for his part, wrote to Jefferson that Hamilton would be a, an excellent candidate for the Treasury. So in that same year of 1789, Madison proposed amendments to the Constitution. And then there's, there's a number of reasons for this. Um, uh, again, he had been against the amendments originally, but um, North Carolina was still refusing to ratify. Um, the Anti-Federalists were about to propose their own amendments, and who knows what form they would have taken. And um, Madison saw how hard it was for him to get elected in the face of opposition in uh, Virginia. So that pushed him in the direction of going for an explicit Bill of Rights. And there's a quote from Robert Morris. Um, Poor Madison got so cursedly frightened in Virginia that I believe he has dreamed of amendments ever since. Um, so that's you know Morris's take on it. Um, and in November of 1789, Hamilton and Madison are still uh, in, on good terms. And Hamilton asked Madison for advice on ways to increase governor, government revenue and deal with the debt. Uh, Madison wrote back with a list of possible taxes, um, but he also added that he was opposed to a permanent debt and he hoped that Madison would work to extinguish it. Um, so they were still on amicable terms, but you could hear the beginnings of, of that opposition. And uh, the beginning of the permanent rupture really did happen when um, Hamilton submitted his report on credit to the Congress. Um, looking back after he left Treasury, Hamilton identified this debate as the start of the rift between them. So Hamilton argued uh, mainly in the report on credit, the debt should be funded, uh, the federal government should assume the state debts, and all holders of government debt should be treated equally without discrimination, regardless of whether they were veterans or speculators or someone else. And Madison, at this point, surprised Hamilton by speaking out forcefully against his plan and in favor of discrimination. Hamilton confronted uh, Madison privately, reminding him that he had opposed discrimination back in, in the Confederation Congress. And Madison admitted this. He admitted he changed his point of view, but he said, he was worried about rampant speculation, and he was sympathetic to the veterans. And we know that um, Hamilton said that a, um, a public debt, if it is not excessive, is a public blessing, especially if there's a means of extinguishing it. Uh, and Hamilton, uh, Madison wrote to Richard Henry Lee um, the opposite. He said, a public debt is a public curse, and in a representative government, it is a greater curse than in any other. So uh, Madison proposed this compromise on discrimination that would reward the current holders of securities, whoever they were, um, allowing them to receive the market price, but then compensating the original suffer sufferers, that is the veterans, for the difference between the market price and the price they had received when selling their securities. And some observers praised Madison for his humanity, but many congressmen ridiculed the idea as completely impracticable. And Hamilton convinced Congress and the president this, this, that discrimination was unworkable. Uh, the, the records were lost and you know, destroyed, and also it would ruin America's chances of being considered creditworthy. So if you, know, if you can't tr uh, trust a, a contract, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. So even though Madison lost this debate, he admitted that Hamilton had um, pretty strong logic in his report. And then the next um, debate was over the federal assumption of state debts. Madison opposed this because Virginia had already paid off their debts. They didn't want to subsi uh, subsidize states like uh, Massachusetts and South Carolina that still had not done so. And Madison argued if the goal is to strengthen the federal government, this should be done by amending the Constitution, not by assumption. And the House agreed. And now it was Hamilton's turn to be upset because he had understood exactly the opposite from Madison at the Constitutional Convention. And now we come to the, uh, the Compromise of 1790 or the Dinner Table Compromise. So uh, Jefferson saw uh, Hamilton wandering around outside despondent and uh, at least according to Jefferson, he, he set up this meeting that led to the Compromise. 
So Jefferson and Madison agreed not to oppose assumption in, ex in exchange for Hamilton's agreement not to oppose moving the capital from New York to Philadelphia and then to the Potomac. And Virginia also would get an extra $500,000 in assumption distribution, so it was a pretty sweet deal for them. Um, and Madison doesn't, doesn't seem to have said too much about the deal, but Jefferson thought that it was the worst political mistake he ever made in his life and was determined never to repeat it. Um, so now we'll go to the Bank of the United States. So Hamilton uh, proposed in his uh, report on the bank an institution like the Bank of England. So it will collect taxes, it will make loans, um, it will facilitate economic growth, it'll um, enable currency flow and uh, credit and taxation. But a lot of uh, Southerners feared that this was going to give too much power to the North. Madison, for his part, uh, um, focused on constitutionality, so favoring a strict interpretation of the Constitution. So only those powers that were explicitly enumerated um, could be um, allowed to Congress. And it said, you know, Article 1, Section 8 said nothing about a bank. And so Madison argued. Um, that if Congress could, pay, could create a bank on the basis of implied powers under the Necessary and Proper Clause, then it would have unlimited power. So again, this is a, a, exactly the opposite of what he was uh, uh, arguing in 1783. And so despite Madison's efforts, both houses of Congress passed the bill, they sent it to the president, but uh, the debate wasn't over. So Washington asked advice from his Secretary of State, Jefferson, from the Attorney General, Randolph, and they gave arguments similar to Madison's. But then Washington held conversations with Madison and even asked him to draft a veto uh, message so it would be ready in case it was needed. And then Washington asked Hamilton for his opinion, and Hamilton, as we know, gave a lengthy defense, uh, arguing for broad implied powers. And interestingly, Hamilton's defense of the bank was closer to arguments made in the Federalists, including arguments made by Madison and Federalist 44, than they were to Madison's current arguments against it, and Washington signed the bill. So as a result of these ongoing disputes, uh, on a personal level, Mas Madison became more firmly opposed to Hamilton, more distant from Washington, and closer to Jefferson. Uh, and Madison started advocating more and more for the powers or the rights of states and against consolidation, as they called it, and strong central government. And contrary to what Madison wrote in Federalist 10, he now saw risks in a large republic that needed to be countered by public opinion and by the states and by the press. And now, now we'll take a look at the report on manufacturers. So here's um, the Great Falls of the Passaic uh, in Patterson where Hamilton uh, planned his uh, city, uh, manufacturing city. So Hamilton argued that, that the country needed to expand and diversify its manufacturing base, and he recommended the government give bounties or direct subsidies to businesses, and he proposed tariffs on imported goods to pr promote to domestic manufacturers. And Hamilton argued that uh, these bounties were appropriate under the general welfare clause of the Constitution. And then uh, in response, Madison wrote, the federal government has hitherto been limited to the specified powers by the greatest champions for latitude in expanding those powers. If not only the means, but the objects are unlimited, then the parchment, that is the Constitution, had better be thrown into the fire at once. So if, you know, if the government is going to subsidize business, then the Constitution is finished. So uh, Madison ends up believing, even though he had been so firmly opposed to faction, now he had to create a political party to save the country from the, from the, uh, from the administration, and he needed a newspaper to help him do this. And um, so here on the left, you see the Gazette of the United States, the Federalist uh, newspaper, and on the right, the National Gazette, uh, the Democratic Republican newspaper. So actually, the Gazette of the United States came first. That was founded in 1789. It was entirely pro-administration, and it received government printing contracts. But in 1791, uh, Madison asked uh, Philip Freneau to start an opposition newspaper. He asked Jefferson to give him a job 
at the State Department to provide him with income. And then Madison wrote 19 anonymous articles attacking Hamilton and his programs. So in one, um, in one article he said, in every political society, parties are unavoidable. The great object should be to combat the evil. So this is interesting. Again, Hamilton had always been against factions, and now he's saying they're essential. Um, he also uh, previously had been much more open to the idea of manufacturing than Jefferson had, uh, but now he's praising the rural agricultural life and he's criticizing the corruption of city life, which leads um, either to prison or to the madhouse. And then, um, without mentioning any names, um, but we know who he's talking about, is Hamilton. So Madison um, asks in the title, The Union, who are his real friends? And he says his friends are not those who favor measures pampering the spirit of speculation, who would pervert the limited government of the Union into a government of unlimited discretion, or who avow principles of monarchy and aristocracy in opposition to the Republican principles of the Union. So um, this is interesting. Uh, so again, this um, you know Madison had not previously complained about Hamilton's you know, alleged preference for monarchy, but now he's he's pulling out that charge. Um, and in spite of all this, um, Washington in 1792 wants to retire after one term. He asks Madison uh, to draft the farewell address for him, and Madison says, "Please don't go. If you go, there are people worse than you." way worse than you, who will succeed you, and you seem to have Hamilton and his supporters in mind. So Hamilton uh, you know, was hearing, um, you know, he was reading the newspapers, and he was hearing what Madison said in Congress, and he wrote a long letter to Ed Edward Carrington in 1792, and he said Madison was trying to insinuate unfavorable impressions of him, but Hamilton tried to ignore them. But then in the most recent session of Congress, he wrote, Mr. Madison, cooperating with Mr. Jefferson, is at the head of a faction decidedly hostile to me and my administration, and actuated by views, in my judgment, subversive of the principles of good government and dangerous to the union, peace, and happiness of the country. And Madison, you know, looking at this, uh, he suggests that maybe Madison, I'm uh, sorry, Hamilton thought maybe Madison was, you know, again, too much. Um, subservient to Virginia politics. He needed to maintain his popularity there and promote Virginia interests if, in order to stay in office. Or maybe he was too much under the influence of Jefferson. And for his part, Madison thought that Hamilton was going too far in enlarging and strengthening the national government. Also, Madison was receiving negative reports about Hamilton. So uh, uh, John Beckley, the clerk of the House of Representatives, writes, our, dis our domestic affairs seem to me to be fast verging on the issue of a contest between the Treasury Department on the one side and the people. The late insidious attack on Mr. Jefferson, which is generally imputed to Mr. Hamilton, marks the lengths they will go and the arts they will practice. And then Beckley continues, William Heth also informs me that Mr. H universally declares that you, Madison, are his personal and political enemy. Now, um, I, I'm kind of troubled by this quote because um, it gets used a lot by historians to show how Hamilton supposedly hated Madison. Um, but you have to note that this contains a lot of second and third hand information and is reported by Beckley, who's a political ally of Jefferson, so it may not be 100% accurate. So um, we'll take a look at the um, proclamation of neutrality. So in 1793, revolutionary France asked the US to join it in war against England. And the question was if the US was bound by the Treaty of Amity with France from 1778. So we were obligated to help France in time of war. And Madison said, along with Jefferson, we have to honor that treaty. And Hamilton said, no, um, the French government we signed the agreement with no longer exists. And also this treaty was a defensive alliance and France was the aggressor now in war against England. So Washington issued the proclamation of neutrality. Madison and Jefferson said, no, you don't have the constitutional authority to do that unilaterally. You have to go through Congress. And Hamilton said, well, 
Congress alone can declare war, but Washington wasn't declaring war. He was declaring neutrality, so it was perfectly acceptable. And Jefferson tried to, uh, he actually did talk Madison into responding to Hamilton's essays and writing as Helvidius, Madison did that and he argued for a limited executive and separation of powers, but he couldn't match Hamilton's logic. So uh, pretty much uh, people agree that uh, Pacificus was much more effective than Helvidius. And then we'll take a look at the, uh, the Jay Treaty. So um, this is something that doesn't happen much anymore. The president sent the Supreme Court Chief Justice um, as a negotiator uh, with a foreign power. Uh, Jay went to uh, London and he was supposed to negotiate uh, outstanding uh, issues from the Treaty of Paris that ended the Revolutionary War, like the uh, British troops uh, refusing to leave the American forts in the Northwest. And Jay believed that he had obtained the best treaty possible, but when he came back, the, he faced severe criticism and people were burning him in effigy uh, up and down the coast. And um, Hamilton, writing as Camillus, defended the treaty forcefully. And this was the point where Jefferson wrote, Hamilton is really a colossus to the anti-Republican party, the Federalists. Um, without numbers, he is a host within himself. In truth, when he comes forward, there is nobody but you, Madison, who can meet him. But this time, Madison decided not to work with the newspapers. Um, but Hamilton, that didn't stop Hamilton. Hamilton um, you know, referenced the debates at the Constitutional Convention. He mentioned Madison by name. He cited Madison's Federalist 42. And he said uh, if Madison were being candid, uh, he could vouch for the accuracy of Camillus's statements in these essays. So Madison didn't respond in the newspapers, but he led the attack on the treaty in the House, and his argument was, listen, the House is supposed to regulate commerce, and there's uh, commercial elements in this treaty, so um, the House should have a say in this. And if Congress could not check the president in this way, uh, he would have unlimited power to make a treaty on any subject whatsoever, including limiting free speech, including establishing religion. And Madison made this argument in spite of the fact that the Constitution clearly gives treaty-making power exclusively to the President and to the Senate. And he made this uh, argument despite the fact that freedom of speech and religion are domestic, not uh, foreign issues. And at this time, the House uh, passed a resolution demanding that Washington hand over all the papers related to the treaty. And Washington refused on the grounds of the need for uh, security or, and secrecy in negotiations. And this led to the precedent of executive privilege. And Washington also disclosed this confidential fact that a proposal that a treaty be ratified by law, that is by both the House and the Senate, that was discussed actually at the Constitutional Convention and it was rejected. And you know, Madison must have known this. Of course he knew it. So ultimately, in a very, very close vote, the House approved funding for the treaty. But um, soon after this defeat, Madison decided not to run for re-election. And um, a, a very um, negative result for Madison was that um, his attacks against Washington led to the end of their friendship. And Washington believed that Madison was accusing him of violating his constitutional oath. So instead, um, so now in 1796, uh, Washington asks Hamilton, not Madison, uh, to prepare his uh, farewell address. And he includes explicitly uh, some of the partisan attacks that were made against Washington during his second term. So now we're gonna take a look um, quickly at the uh, Adams administration. So um, disagreement between the US and France led to the Quasi War in 1798 and President Adams asked Washington to come out of retirement to head the army. And Washington agreed on the condition that Hamilton be in charge of day-to-day -day operations. So Hamilton was appointed Major General, Inspector General, uh, but no land battles occurred. And um, at the, however, the Federalists made a really um, serious mistake. So they were trying to take advantage of war fever to, um, uh, to further their goals and they overplayed their hands. They passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, and Hamilton actually advised against these acts um, as he thought they were a little bit of an overreach and it was gonna be politically dangerous. 
And in response to the acts, Jefferson, again, the sitting vice president of the United States, anonymously wrote the Kentucky resolutions. And the vice president was claiming that states had the right to reject federal laws that they considered unauthorized. And um, Madison thought that Jefferson had gone too far and he chose much more moderate language for the, for the Virginia resolutions, and he argued only that states were duty-bound to, quote, interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. Uh, so uh, he was arguing for interposition um, rather than nullification. But even though Madison was trying to walk back some of Jefferson's extreme statements, they sort of got lumped together so no other state um, followed Virginia and, uh, and Kentucky with these resolutions. So now we'll take a look at the election of 1800. So this was the beginning of the end for the Federalists. So um, in large measure, because of the unpopularity of uh, Adams, because of the Alien and Sedition Acts, in spite of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, uh, the Democratic Republicans took the presidency, they took the House, they took the Senate, and the Federalists never again had control of any of these. Um, and Hamilton, though he was out of office, led the Federalist opposition to Jefferson's policies until his death in a duel with Aaron Burr in July of 1804. So Madison in 1801 became Jefferson's Secretary of State. And now, interestingly, that they had executive power, they went back a little bit on some of their Republican policies. So one example was the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Um, so um, Jefferson was worried that he would not be able to do this. Uh, it would be unconstitutional without an amendment. And Madison sort of you know, convinced him that we, we need to act now before Napoleon changes his mind. So in spite of the fact that uh, they both knew that under their principles this was a great overreach, they decided to go ahead with it. Uh, and regarding the military, on the one hand, uh, Jefferson sent the Navy and the Marines against the Barbary pirates. But on the other hand, despite severe threats from Britain, Madison and Jefferson focused on state militias rather than standing army. And Jefferson wanted gunboats rather than a Navy, preferring what they called Republican over imperial tools. And Madison uh, favored economic sanctions over force. So now um, we'll go to the Madison administration. So when he became president in 1809, he tried to continue a lot of the domestic and foreign policy that Jefferson and he had implemented. However, increasingly boxed in by the French and British uh, trade restrictions and under pressure from a new generation of congressmen called War Hawks, Madison declared war on England in 1812. However, um, because he had relied on state militias for defense, the military was ill-prepared for war, and Congress was not really coming through with the necessary funding. And the New England states uh, declined uh, to send their militias. Also, um, Madison didn't do uh, enough to uh, get the Bank of the United States rechartered, so it was um, turned, you know, his vice president, uh, Clinton, cast the tie-breaking vote to send uh, to send the bill back down to defeat. So there was no Bank of the US in the build up to the war. So the country lacked the financial resources it needed and that crippled the war effort. And by the end of the war, Madison had to modify a lot of his opposition to Hamilton's programs. So in his message to Congress on the Peace Treaty of Ghent, Madison actually endorsed a standing army an expanded Navy, better harbor defenses and better military training and education and in his annual message to Congress at the end of 1815, Madison argued for a peacetime army of 10,000 men, much bigger than he or Jefferson would have allowed uh, back in you know, a decade earlier. Um, and um, Madison said that the Bank of the United States, as it turns out, was actually constitutional. And that was because the people and congressmen and other institutions recognize it as such. And in 1816, he actually did sign a bill to charter the Second Bank of the United States. And he also expressed renewed support for manufacturers. So in conclusion, Madison and Hamilton started out as allies. They were supporting a stronger union. They were working together in the Confederation Congress at the Annapolis Convention, the Philadelphia Convention. They were working together to write the Federalist Essays and they were supporting each other at their states ratifying conventions. 
And it, it seems like while Hamilton was maintaining a consistent course, Madison turned against Hamilton to some degree out of concern that Hamilton's policies were going too far in the direction of expanded central government powers, but primarily due to uh, political pressure in Virginia, the risk of losing his seat in Congress, influence from his friend Thomas Jefferson, and perhaps jealousy that Hamilton had displaced him in the favor of President Washington. Uh, and in doing so, um, Madison turned his back on many of the principles that he had previously advocated in collaboration with Hamilton. But then in, later on, when he served as Secretary of State and as President, Madison returned to many of these same principles that he had shared with Hamilton. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.